Pull your money now as over 11 billion in deposits are frozen. I'm your host, Steve Van Meter, and thanks for joining me today. And customers of a large lender are finding out a worst case scenario when they woke up this morning to find out that their money's not good as their deposits are frozen. And this is all happening at a time when panic is roiling through the stock markets. Let's pick today's story up where we head over to the Wall Street Journal who headlines the big crypto lender Celsius freezes all account withdrawals. The firm manages more than 11 billion in customer assets. One of the largest crypto lenders, Celsius Network, told users Sunday night that it's pausing all withdrawal swaps and transfers between accounts due to extreme market conditions. We're taking this necessary action for the benefit of our entire community in order to stabilize liquidity and operations while we take steps to preserve and protect assets, according to the company. Celsius lends out, to custom, lends out customer deposits to other users to earn a return. And this is kind of the key part of the story that I don't think people understand is when a bank takes on deposits, now in this case it's a crypto lender, but that really isn't relevant to how this works, is when a lender, a bank, loans money out, well, if there's a run on deposits, if people start demanding their money and the bank doesn't have it, well, there's only one option they have, and that's to shut the doors. In this case, what you're seeing is as liquidity and crypto prices start to fall, people want access to their money. The bank has already lent it out. Well, in this case, you can't have it. So rather than give some people the option to get their money out, they're slamming the door. And all that does is create even more panic selling when the day comes that people can access their accounts again. The firm managed $11.8 billion in assets as of May 17th, according to its website, where it offers user, users an annual percentage yield of over 18% on cryptocurrency deposits. The company said it has 1.7 million users who now are a lot broker. Celsius raised $750 million in funding late last year from investors, including a Canadian pension fund, and that can't be good if you're relying on a check from that company. In April, Celsius came under regulatory pressure and stopped offering high interest bearing accounts to non accredited investors in the U.S. Some market observers claim Celsius also played a role in the collapse of Luna and Terra USD cryptocurrencies last month with Celsius disputes. And their announcement comes at the tail end of a brutal weekend for crypto. And in the last 24 hours, Bitcoin has fallen. Well, let's just say a lot. And that happened when that happens. Of course, people that own it would like to sell it. And in this case, if you got your account in Celsius, the answer is no, you're stuck. And that could be a huge problem because those who have borrowed it, well, they're under contractual obligation. Celsius can't force them to return the money they borrowed. And think about this. If I went out and rented a car, for example, for 30 days, and a week into that rental, prices started collapsing and the rental company wanted to sell that vehicle to mitigate their losses, well, they can't force me to return it because I have a contract. And in this case, Obviously, Celsius has lent money out. They've got contract obligations on that money and they can't ask it back. But what they can do is tell all those people who have their money there that they just can't have it in hopes that it comes back at a value that people are happy with. But with prices falling right now and the Fed draining liquidity, it doesn't really appear that that could happen. And Celsius said it hoped to lift the suspension on withdrawal swaps and transfers as quickly as possible, but couldn't predict when that would happen. There's a lot of work ahead as we consider various options. That process will take time and there will be delays. And many people are just hoping now to get their money back at a point where we really want to start talking about what's going on in the markets today. We saw overnight liquidity just drained out, futures crashing, interest rates rising. And what is it that changed between Friday and today? Well, let's head over to Bloomberg, who's got this headline as U.S. bonds flag recession risk with 75 basis point hike in play as now markets are pricing in 175 points of Fed tightening by September. And that's really what changed was that hotter than expected CPI print is now caused some people to believe that the Fed is going to go now from 50 basis points, which is widely believed and accepted now as high as 75 basis points. And one thing we know is the markets hate uncertainty. And now all of a sudden there's a ton of uncertainty. The hottest U.S. inflation in four decades will push the Federal Reserve to raise interest rates more aggressively this year, and this recession may not be far behind. Those are dramatic signals coming from markets as traders continue to assess the latest inflation surge. 
On Monday, a closely watched part of the U.S. yield curve inverted, which will cover more in today's show, on growing concern that tighter monetary policy will take a toll, a bigger toll on economic growth. The Fed hasn't hiked by three quarters of a percent since 1994, and tightening this magnitude is fueling concerns of reduced consumer spending and business activity. That sparked a global equity sell-off and pushed the S&P 500 closer to a bear market. Short-term yields that are higher than long-term yields are abnormal and are historically seen as heralding a potential recession. And the reason they do that is because when short-term interest rates are higher than long-term, it says that inflation is eating into growth expectations. Normally, what you want is short-term rates lower than intermediate-term rates, which is lower than long-term rates. And that tells you that the economy and the outlook for the economy is good, that it means growth will outpace inflation. And now what we're starting to to see is that inflation will outpace growth at a time, as the article said, consumers are already backing off their spending. And what did we find on Friday? We got this. The consumer sentiment collapses to record low. Keyword record low as the University of Michigan now records record low consumer sentiment as both current conditions and future expectations are crashing. And normally what happens is when, cons- when expectations from sentiment start to fall, perhaps even to record low levels, what it means is consumers are already telling you that they're going to stop spending. And the reason you notice, and we'll, we don't have a chart today on this, but we will in the future, is the reason the stock market goes down when consumer sentiment is because spending is going to go down. And stock market goes down to price in, of course, a lack of future demand lower profits, lower earnings. And that's why we see with the lag, the equity markets fall of sentiment. The other reason we start thing we start to see is yields fall as sentiment falls. Now, this is an unusual as we're seeing yields rise, rise, rise out of this fear of inflation. But what gets consumers to spend? And this is what I want you to think about is what would it take to get this change in sentiment? Well, is it higher consumer prices? No. Is it higher oil prices? No. Is it higher interest rates? No. All those things Things need to come down to get consumers to spend, particularly at a point where we're starting to see retailers and wholesalers you know, announce that they've got massive amounts of inventory and more coming on the way. And that's why you see when sentiment collapses, not only does the stock market go down, but interest rates go down. And perhaps the bigger story is when interest rates eventually do reverse and head lower. As inflation is now exceeding wage growth, prompting, as we've covered in the show many times, prompting many Americans to dip into savings and take on more debt, which will be short-lived, and they will change their spending habits sooner than later. As high prices leave less income for discretionary purchases, the risk of the economy is more pronounced slowdown in consumer spending. And here you can see expected change in real income during the next year are falling, and real being inflation-adjusted income. So consumers are already waking up to the reality is that, hey, Prices are going to likely keep going up, but my wages aren't. And for the moment, they're financing that gap. But there will be a point when that changes and when that happens, well, the economy is likely to head into a recession. Amid the market turmoil, all eyes will see this on this week's Fed statement in Jared Jerome Powell's post meeting press conference, where policymakers' characterization of inflation and long term forecast for the federal funds target, or so called dot plot, which is highly inaccurate to begin with, will be critical. The high inflation print has put a dent into peak inflation and peak hawkishness narrative, according to an interest rate strategist. From a Fed perspective, the question is whether they will need to respond even more forcefully with a 75 basis point hike at the June meeting. And the combination of collapsing consumer sentiment, unexpectedly intense price pressures, and expectations of Fed activism are conspiring to create a particularly toxic cocktail for risky assets, which resonates with the notion that the need to tackle elevated price pressures will see the Fed tip the economy into recession. And of course, this is something that we've talked about this, and why this always happens is the Fed over tightens and there's a lag in monetary policy somewhere around a year, maybe longer, depending on the size of the Fed's balance sheet. So all the tightening the Fed's doing today to combat inflation will eventually kick in. And of course, we got quantitative tightening starting this week as well. So just as the economy is going to likely be heading deeper into a recession down in the year to come, well, that means all this lagged monetary policy is going to kick in as well. And this view is consistent with expectations that the Fed will need to loosen policy again within two years as the market is already positioning for policymakers to respond to the looming slowdown with future rate cuts 
pricing two quarter points of easing by the middle of 2024. Of course, the markets are always hoping for easing because they're concerned that the Fed's going to continue to tighten and that's going to absolutely obliterate risk assets as we're still in the early stages of the Fed tightening. And there's one thing that shouldn't get obliterated during a Fed tightening cycle, and that's your portfolio. I'll put a link up here in the corner portfolio shield in the description below. It stays like today when stocks are down deep, that is hedging is performing very well. Now let's move on to what the bigger issue here is. And of course, that is the jawboning from the Fed. It's all about what is to come. We know at least there's a 50 basis point hike coming on Wednesday, and most likely that's what we'll get. The market is making a big deal of this 75 basis point notion. And I want you to understand that this comes after a lot of investments banks were telling people, buy the dip, buy the dip, buy the dip. And then all of a sudden, oh, by the way, we think there may be a 75 basis pointer coming on Wednesday, and boom, everything crashed is down, you start to wonder who's selling into this buying? Well, it's always the big players. The Fed will raise rates this week ahead, but what Chair Powell says may matter the most, which it always does. I think really the key thing is what Powell talks about in the conference, and does he give anything that sounds like firm guidance for September? According to Michael Schumacher, the head of macro strategy at Wells Fargo, if he does, he would only do it if he was going to be hawkish. If he doesn't, people view it as dovish. And that's the key. June and July's rate hikes are baked in the cake. People believe it. Now everyone thinks he's going to pause by September. They're hoping he does. Not sure he will, but that's what everyone's watching for right now. The market wants some clear and convincing evidence that the Fed can pull this off without starting a recession, which will just say good luck, as maybe we're stuck in purgatory for a while, as the market will soon now start taking its cues from the economic data, which we know is heading lower. And that also added fuel to the debate about whether the Fed will consider a 75 basis point rate hike, which I'll say I don't think they will, and continue at a more aggressive pace. Both Barclays and Jefferies changed their forecast Friday, coincidentally, after everyone's been buying, to include a 75 basis point hike for Wednesday, though other economists still expect half a point, which is more realistic. The Fed rarely will change its mind that close to a meeting whenever when the consensus is already telling them what to do. Remember, the Fed listens to the market and tries to do what's priced in. But what is the bigger goal here of the Fed is they need to bring inflation down. What's the biggest component and driver of inflation? That's energy prices. And so what is actually going to happen here is the Fed's going to continue tighten until oil prices and gas prices come down. Because here, when we look at the consumer price index on a year-over-year -year rate of change, and we look at West Texas Intermediate on a year-over-year -year rate of change, we notice there's a pretty good relationship here. And really, the Fed needs oil prices to come down. They need demand for crude and gasoline to fall to bring inflation down because it falls with a lag. And notably, it's many months, oftentimes, that it takes for the CPI to come down. And what is the big driver for demand? Well, if you bring stock, the stock market down, now we'll overlay the Wilshire 5000 price index on a year-over-year -year rate change in blue against West Texas Intermediate, also on a year-over-year -year rate change in red. And notice as the market starts to come down, crude oil also with a lag eventually starts to follow it lower. And of course, that's what it will take. If people wanna know what will take the Fed to quit, bring gas prices down, bring oil prices down, bring inflation down, and that's what will take the Fed. But due to the lags in, in the system, it's gonna be a while, and now the bond market is even starting to tell us that, hey, there's a big problem. As the US bond market flashes, recession warning is yield curve inverts. The US two-year exceeded the 10-year for the first time since early April. The short-term yields that are higher than long-term yields are abnormal and are historically seen as heralding a potential recession. And as we talked about earlier, that happens because when inflation expectations out pace growth inflate expectations, you get a recession because people can't afford higher prices. Those higher prices get rejected, inventory start to build, and next thing you know, prices started getting cut as retailers and wholesalers need to move inventory desperately, and next thing you know, you're in a recession. Concern has been mounting that surging inflation will require more rapid Federal Reserve policy tightening, which in turn will reduce consumer spending and business activity. U.S. inflation data on Friday rose to a fresh four-decade high. Shocking economists. At the same time, the former Fed Chair Bernanke says the Fed can sidestep big reflation by in, by in inflation fight. As he said, the U.S. economy today is a mixed bag as a recession is possible. 
Economists are very bad at predicting recessions, he said, but I think the Fed has a decent chance, a reasonable chance of what Jay Powell calls a softest landing. And such a scenario could look like no recession or a mild recession that brings down the hottest U inflation in the 40 years, according to Bernanke. He pointed to political support for an independent Fed and expressed hope that supply chains will improve and that oil and food prices, as a key point, will stabilize or moderate. Well, Bernanke, I think the key is we're going to have a recession, and if we're lucky, it will be mild, but in reality, it's going to be pretty deep. As consumers have already said, sentiment is in the toilet. They're cutting their spending. Interest rates are too high. Gas prices are too high, and the Fed is aggressively tightening. And when you tack on things like what's going on at Celsius, where people are seeing their deposits are locked up, well, that's going to change sentiment even more, and people are going to stop spending and hoarding their money. And at that point, it's too late. I'm Steve Van Meter. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being fans. Bye now.